Morning, everybody. We'll just wait a few moments just to give chance for people to see the notification, to see that we've gone live and to join us this morning. This is the second day of Grace Life Church Converse. And it's great to see people joining this morning. It's a nice day in Halifax. Not going to complain about that. Hopefully it's a nice day wherever you are. Ken, can you turn the comments on for me so I can see who's, who's joining? Let's see who's joining. <clears throat> Oh, I can see some comments now. I can see people that are joining. That's great. Well, just while folks are joining, my husband Mark's going to tinkle a little bit. Oh, hi from Australia, Margaret. My goodness, what time is it there? Oh, wow, Margaret. Yeah. Hey, sis. Morning, Miriam. and I saw Pastor Mpula singing and I thought I can't sing. You don't want to hear my singing voice. <laughs> so Kenea has really kindly offered to, um, well she didn't offer, she was volunteered, <laughs> to sing a worship song to open day two of the conference today and she's going to sing about raising an alleluia. We all know about that, it's a song that you know very well so if you're not sure of it find the lyrics on your phone and then you can sing along in your homes. This is Day two of Grace Life Conference, and uh, we heard from Pastor last night uh, a really awesome sermon about leveling up, and we're going to hear much more today. So I'm going to hand across to Kanea, and Kanea is going to sing for us. Raise a hallelujah! There you go, Kanea. Seats all yours. Thank you. 
that this morning. That was a great song to sing at the start of a conference called Amplify for us to raise louder our hallelujahs in the presence of our enemy. It's actually not what I'm going to speak on but I'm pretty sure that somebody before the end of this weekend will cover that particular topic. I want to just say a big thank you to Pastor David and to Pastor Max for the kind invitation to share with you today at this very important event uh, hosted by Elohim church in Bradford. I, I did have the opportunity actually to um, speak at LOM in Bradford. It was a year ago this weekend because it popped up as a reminder on my Facebook this morning. And uh, I know many folks there, so the names that are popping up on the screen, I recognise some of them. And uh, hopefully as a result of today and meeting you more broadly as a church, uh, I'll gain some new friends out of that. Last night, Pastor David called everyone to level up. He called everyone, not just some, everybody who was listening to move into a higher level in God, putting behind us our childhood level of understanding, our childhood level of speech, our childhood level of thought, and instead grow in God so that we know the fullness of God in our lives. And if you didn't hear his sermon last night, I'm sure you can go back onto Facebook and hear it again and you'll make plenty of notes every time you listen to it, I'm sure. That message was a great message for me to build upon with what the Lord has asked me to speak on today with the conference theme of Amplify. Now, Amplify often makes us think about sound and increasing its volume. And there's lots and lots of sounds in the Bible, some that you would really like to hear and turn up, and some which if you heard, you would turn down. Like, for example, the beautiful sound that is described in the book of Ezekiel of the angel wings. Oh my goodness, has anybody ever read that and thought, I would love to hear that? Where it talks about the angel wings moving and the sound filled the whole of the temple and you could hear it outside in the courts. You'd love to have that when you're on your, on your phone or something to be able to hear that. The kind of sounds that we would not want to hear are things like the sound of a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. That's the sound that comes off our life when we speak like angels, but we don't speak with a heart of love we would turn that sound down straight away. Well, I'm, ha I'm sat in my husband's studio where there are amplifiers around me which can control how loud or how quiet something is. 
So this room is a great setting for me to share some thoughts on the things that we should turn up the volume on in our lives and things where we should turn the volume down. Now I have to say when I was preparing for this message I was a little bit perplexed by it because um, everything I'm going to speak about you've heard it all before. You've heard it preached 10,000 times. And you know what our minds are like, we, we, we are, are made to process things quickly. So when something's familiar, we can uh, gloss over it. We can almost um, skip over what is familiar in order that our brains can process what is new. And that can make sometimes the truth that we read feel a little less weighty. So this morning we need the Holy Spirit to help us pause for a moment to take hold of what we already know and allow him to help us act on it. So let me share with you my main text for this morning, which comes from the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to believers. And it says this in Romans chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Romans 6, verse 9 to 11. And I'm going to read it to you from the New King James Version. Romans 6, 9 to 11. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Therefore, do not let rain, sin reign in your mortal body. Reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. We must turn down the volume of sin in our lives, reckon ourselves dead to it, and we do this by turning up the volume on being alive to God in Jesus. This happens simultaneously. The more we live every day alive to God, the less we live every day alive to sin. This is our choice. We control this. The volume button is in our hand because we read we are to reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. We are alive to God when we make a decision to repent of our sins, to confess with our mouths and to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and invite him into our lives as Lord and Saviour. And some of you will have done that last night for the very first time and you are now born again into the kingdom of light, into God's family. It is our responsibility then to walk out daily in our salvation. Not earning our salvation, we have that, we are saved, but we live a life that reflects it in our behaviour. And this is where we can turn the volume up. Now, when Mark is thinking about turning the volume up on things, in fact, I've got something on screen here, but you can't see it, but it's got all sorts of things which can mix sound. When Mark is thinking about this, he knows the kind of blend that he is wanting out of the sound. So let me ask you this question. What is the blend of sin and righteousness that we are looking for? We just read in this scripture that the standard modelled for us is Jesus. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all and the life he lives, he lives to God. That tells me there is no optimum blend where there is a mix of sin and righteousness in our lives. There's no good mix of that. One has to be zero the other has to be 100%. Now we know that, but honestly, that's not always how we live. There are sins that we're okay with. Yeah, we're irritated by some of our sin and oh, we feel 
badly about it, but not enough to really do something to deal with it. So we have the volume of sin set to a level that we think is probably okay. After all, Jesus loves us. He knows what we're like. We work in progress. The thing is, it's not okay for us to feel like we can have an acceptable level of sin in our lives. Sin has a terrible effect on us in ways in which we can see and ways in which we cannot see. Pastor David said something very profound last night. He said, some Christians are in bondage even though they are saved. That bondage comes from sin. Maybe we would like to think, well, you know, it was an attack of the enemy. We can blame him, make it look like we were powerless in it. But the truth is this, the enemy cannot put you into bondage. Once you are saved, your life is hid with Christ in God. He no longer has any control over you. We heard it last night. In fact, Pastor put down his iPad and demonstrated it for us. Satan is under our feet. But what he can do is this. He can tempt us into doing something that will mean that we bring ourselves into bondage. We bring ourselves under sin. You know what? The devil's good at this. He studied you well. He's paid attention to what you do and don't do. And I say this frequently, that temptation is a tailor-made service from Satan. He's meticulous about working out your preferences. He's very observant about the right time to strike to make sure maximum effectiveness. Now, why do I say that he looks for what our preferences are? Well, it tells us this in James, James chapter 1, verse 14, again from the New King James Version. James says this, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, let me illustrate this for you with a story that I read on the internet this week. Now, you might have heard it before. I've never heard it before, so you'll enjoy it even if you have. But it's a story from history, from 14th century history. So this is going back a long while. And it's about two brothers in Belgium. The eldest of these brothers is called Reynold III, and he was a duke, a titled member of the royal family. This Reynold was grossly overweight. Reynold was commonly known by his nickname, which meant fat. Not very nice, but that's what he was known by. Now, after a violent quarrel, Reynold's younger brother, Edward, led a successful revolt against him. And Edward captured Reynold, but he didn't kill him. Instead, what he did was this. He built a room around Reynold in the castle and he promised him that he could regain his title and his property as soon as he was able to leave the room. Now, this would not have been difficult for most people because the room had several windows and a door of normal size, none of which were locked, none of which were barred. The problem was is that Reynolds was too big to get through it. The problem was his size. To regain his freedom, he needed to lose weight. Now, Edward knew his older brother really well. And each day, he sent a variety of the most delicious foods. So instead of dieting his way out of prison, Reynold just grew fatter. When the Duke Edward was accused of cruelty, he had an answer ready to give and he said this, my brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. Reynolds stayed in that room for 10 years and he wasn't released until after Edward had died in battle. But by then, his health was so ruined that he himself died within a year, a prisoner to his own appetite. This story illustrates a picture too often of us as Christians. 
We have our freedom in Christ. There are no doors or windows that the enemy can lock around us. But we remain in bondage because like this Duke, we like the tasty treats of sin. We are not a prisoner to them. We could say no. So what is James's advice on this? Well, further on in the chapter, verse 21 to 25, it says this. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. We can say no to temptation just like Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness. He quoted scripture and he acted on it. He was a doer of the word. So let me suggest to you that the volume control in your hand that helps us to be dead to sin and alive to God is labelled obedience. We turn up obedience to God's word and then we simultaneously quieten down sin. It amplifies our being alive to God. The simplicity of obedience. This is not new news, right? We teach this to our kids. We do. We're familiar with this, right? But I think it's good for us to stop and think about our level of obedience and where we can turn the volume up. Peter says this, 1 Peter 1 verse 14 to 16, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just who, as he who, is, who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Well, let me ask you a question on this. On the holiness scale today, with one being not very holy and 10 being as holy as God is holy, where would you measure yourself? Now, it's first thing on a Saturday morning. You won't have had too much of a day to get anything wrong. But where would you pitch yourself on the scale of holiness? Well, even on what we may consider to be a good day, most of us would not measure ourselves well against God's standard of holiness. Well, here's the good news. There is no scale. When we receive Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Saviour, we were made alive to God. And in that moment, we were made holy. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. So there's no need for you to mark yourself low against God's standard of holiness because you are already as holy as you can ever be. Unless, of course, anyone thinks that we can improve on the holiness that we have received through Jesus. What we are asked to do is to walk out in that holiness every day. Walk out in that salvation every day. So that the holiness that we have received from Jesus is reflected in everything that we do, everything we say, how we behave, our attitudes, how we respond to things, the choices that we make. This is where we turn up the volume and it is entirely in our control to do so because walking out in holiness every day is a matter of our will. Choosing every day, 
Are we going to live in accordance with the word of God? Are we going to be obedient children? I mean, how many of us in the morning, especially when we're taking the kids to school, wake up and think, I hope the kids are feeling obedient today, right? When your kids are obedient, it makes the home a whole lot better. When they, whenever, like, Renee is looking at me from behind the iPad. She's a good girl. She, she learned this young. <laughs> but when, when, we are, when, when, when we are obedient, we know it makes for a simpler and an easier life. When we don't allow the sinful desires to have control, but rather we are obedient to God's word, walking just like Jesus did. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself was obedient to the Father. So, you know, James told us um, a moment ago that we are to receive with meekness the word implanted in us, the word that can save us. So our job is to go back into the word and see what it says we're supposed to be obedient to. <laughs> now, here's a really brave prayer from David that will help you get off on the right foot. Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24 you know it already right search me O god and know my heart oh, that's a brave prayer right try me and know my anxious thought and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting this is like asking god to show you where your sin is so that you can reckon yourself dead to it now Spurgeon has got fabulous commentary on this verse in Romans 6 right you, worth reading and, and Spurgeon says this he says you've got to hunt down your sin and hack it to pieces <laughs> I love that phrase we go on a mission with the Holy Spirit Asking God to test our hearts, look for the sin, hunt it down, hunt down the sin in our behaviour, hunt, hunt down the sin in our mindset, hunt down any sin anywhere in our life and hack it to pieces. Get rid of it, reckon yourself to be dead to that sin. To do this, we've got to be hating our sin as much as God does. It costs him to deal with our sin. Now, our sin... It doesn't mind us being irritated with it. Our sin doesn't mind us being frustrated with it, even annoyed by it. But when we hate it, we'll deal with it. Now, we've all got work to do here. Pastor said last night, I know I'm not talking to any perfect Christians, and I know he included himself in that. We are all work in progress, as I said earlier. But, you know, we do have to commit to making that progress. <laughs> <laughs> we do need to put the effort in to work with God to deal with the sin in our lives. Now, it can sound like a really daunting task, but it's not because it's the Holy Spirit's job to help us with this. And he's really good at it. But we do need to commit to going through that process with him. It's a lifelong journey. So if you've not started it, you might as well start it today. Determine that you are going to respond well to everything that he reveals in you. Now, it can be a scary thing to go back into the word and start measuring up your life against it. And in um, Nehemiah 8, well worth a read, um, which I can't read it all to you now, but go, go read it when you have opportunity. And in Nehemiah 8, it gives the account of the um, Israelites who had been away from God in captivity in Babylon who had started to return home and they were rebuilding Jerusalem they rebuilt the altar they were starting to rebuild the temple the wall was being built and Ezra got out the law book of Moses as we would perhaps more commonly known as um, the first five books of our bible and they did this they built Ezra a tower so that folks could see him and hear him read from the law again. Now they hadn't heard it read in the time that they'd been in captivity. So because they'd been in captivity for 70 years, for some people this might have been the first time that they were hearing it, if it hadn't have been passed to them through their parents. And indeed for some people, 
they were no longer fluent in the language. So in and amongst the crowd were translators and teachers to help people understand what they were hearing Ezra read. As they started to hear God's law again, the people became distressed. They became distressed because they realised just how far away from God's standards their lives had grown. Nehemiah encourages them that this is not a day for mourning or weeping, but he says is a day for joyful celebration because now they know God's word. They've got opportunity to do something about it. In fact, he tells them to go and have some cake and some pop. He doesn't quite say it like that. He says choice food and sweet drinks. That to me means cake and pop, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, celebrate together and do not grieve because the joy of the Lord is your strength. We all know that bit of the verse, right? But do we know the story that's in, it's in the context of? He says, don't grieve about this. It's the joy of the Lord that's going to strengthen you and help you to go on this journey of realigning your life to the word of God. We need to have some cake and pop moments ourselves. Enjoy the process of hunting down your sin and hacking it to pieces. The moment we begin to seriously tackle sin in our lives, we will know the joy of the Lord being our strength so that we can see it through. Now, some sin is obvious to it, right? And even now you're probably thinking, yeah, there's a couple of things that I probably need to deal with, right? You know, examples that are common, not paying our taxes correctly, claiming benefits we're not entitled to, judging people, stuff we've gotten into the habit about lying over, bit of exaggeration here, bit of exaggeration there, told the story 10 years ago, kind of got to keep it going, casually slandering people in the middle of a conversation on the phone with our mates. This kind of stuff is obvious, right? But not all of our sin is obvious to us. Some sins we've become so familiar with, they're so embedded and ingrained in us that we call these sinful behaviour traits our character. We make it out like God made us this way. <laughs> oh, it's just me. You know me. I get cross when I'm tired. Well, okay. Well, repent of that. Work out a better sleep pattern and your behaviour will improve. Oh, well, you know, I get angry when I'm hungry. Cool. Go look at your diet so that you're not getting hungry and your blood sugar is at a good level so that you're not getting angry. These are the kind of things that we've got to get into, things that we've passed off as just being how we are. We're just made like that. It's just me. It's just who I am. No, we cannot call sinful behaviour traits character and expect <laughs> to keep getting away with that. Now, here's the interesting bit. Some of our sin is in our blind spot. Others can see it a mile off, but we can't, right? That's true. Nothing wrong with that. Some of our sin is in our blind spot. What happens when we've prayed this prayer and the Holy Spirit encourages somebody to point that out to us? I don't think there are many adults that like being told off by other people. Not at our age. When I was uh, in my 40s, and not anymore, I'm a bit older than that. But when I was in my 40s, my parents wrote a letter to me to, um, sorry, can I just eat an apple behind me? Can I, you can't sit there and eat an apple sorry. while I'm preaching. <laughs> you can go in the kitchen and eat it. Sorry, minor interlude. I, my parents wrote me a letter, right? Because there was a problem between me and my sister. And uh, my dad it was literally banging our heads together in a letter. Oh my gosh, when I opened that letter in my 40s, I hated it. I hated it. Who wants to be told off by the parents in their 40s? I mean, kids don't like it. <laughs> they don't. Never mind when you're a grown-up. As an adult, it's really difficult for us to have our sin pointed out to us by somebody else. Particularly if when they point it out to us, they're a bit clunky in how they do it. 
and they're a bit well we're a bit offended by what they say right well we've got to get over the fact that people may say it in an offensive way and listen to whether there's any truth in their words and if there is truth in their words we've got to receive it whether we're offended or ashamed or whatever by it or not because that could be the Holy Spirit pointing out something to us that we will um, improve upon later in our lives. Now, what about your pastor? What about your leaders? Now, I'm not a pastor, so I can say this, right? Because I'm not a pastor, I don't know what a pastor's job is like, right? But I reckon disciplining people in your congregation must be one of the hardest things to do. Can I encourage you, let your pastor discipline you. Don't be hard work for your pastor, as an individual or as a congregation. Yes, of course, you need to weigh up everything they say and against the word of God, pray about it. But if it's truth, please receive it as truth and correction because you know the Bible tells us that when we know the truth the truth will set us free indeed Paul I and mean, we love to quote from Corinthians right the book of Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to that church to really kick their backsides it is a harsh letter to correct them right it tells us he wrote it in tears and he knew that when they received it they would be sorrowful and he says that's good for you really to experience godly sorrow because godly sorrow produces repentance and that's exactly what it did in them we read in it in second corinthians oh, second book of corinthians that they were eager to clear themselves i mean we're not supposed to be extreme in our responses to discipline right you know hebrews 12 verse 5 tells us not to lose heart when we're disciplined by God, even if it's by other people or by the Holy Spirit, because he's disciplined us because he loves us, right? So we're not supposed to make light of it, sort of like, I don't care. We're not supposed to shrug it off, right? We're not supposed to lose heart like we can do as adults, but we're supposed to be mature in the way that we respond and receive a correction, receive a rebuke and act on it and say where is where, go back to the word of god and say what was i not obedient to that it led to that behavior where have i got to line up my life back to god we have to get serious about tackling sins in our lives reckoning ourselves dead to it which we do by reckoning ourselves alive to god and being obedient to him now why is this so important all of our sin is already forgiven. Jesus has paid the full cost already on the cross. Satan knows that we have open access to God's mercy, his grace and his forgiveness when we do sin. So our eternal salvation from our sins is a battle that he has already lost. But Satan knows that when we do give in to sin, we are often not quick to confess it, we're not quick to deal with it decisively, and that gives him an opportunity to hinder you in fulfilling God's purposes in your life. Just like the overweight Duke was hindered in carrying out his role because of his, he was a victim of his own appetite that his enemy fed, so we can be hindered in moving forward with the things of God because we allow the enemy to feed our appetite for sin. As much as we all prayed last night that we want to level up, we may go nowhere fast until we reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. You know, we reckon ourselves alive to God by looking at what is important and looking at what is important to Jesus. In Matthew 22, Jesus was asked by the Pharisees, well, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus summed up the whole law of God with this. He says, love God, love people. He says the law and the prophets hang on these two things. This tells me 
that we reckon ourselves alive to God when we amplify our love towards him and our love towards other people. That will automatically turn down the volume on sin. In John 13, verse 34, Jesus gave his disciples and us a new commandment that we should love one another. Mm -hmm. Good. By whose standard? His standard. He says, as I have loved you, love one another. Loving one another as Jesus loves us. There can't be anyone listening today who doesn't have to turn up the volume on that, on loving other people in the way that we have been loved. Also, we can see what was important to Jesus was unity. The night before Jesus died, he prayed and his prayer is recorded for us in John 17. He prays for himself, he prays for his disciples and then he prays for us. The overriding theme in Jesus's prayer was that we would be in unity. By what standard? The unity that he has with the Father. If Jesus thought that our unity was important enough to include in one of his last prayers here on earth, then he must have thought we needed help with it, but he also must have thought that it would be an area that the enemy would wreak havoc in. And we can see that, right? Can you imagine for a moment what would happen if we were obedient to all of the commands of Jesus that together meant that we walked in unity? How powerful would that be? How much more of the purposes of God would be fulfilled in our lives, in our churches, in our community and globally across the world? Doing as we are told to by Jesus is really powerful. It's simple obedience. Now, I mentioned earlier one of the other things that Pastor said last night, that he knows that not everyone experiences the fullness of God in their lives. Did you know that the Bible tells us that obedience to God's word turns up the volume on experiencing the fullness of God in our lives. 1 John 2 verse 5 says this, if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. We are all filled with God's love when we are saved. But when we are obedient to God's command, there's a completeness of God's love in us, which is achieved through our obedience. You know, we love the prayer that Paul prays about how we may grasp how wide, how high, how long, how deep is the love of Christ and to know the love that surpasses all knowledge that we will be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. We love that prayer, right? Did we know that a key to that was obedience? When we turn up the volume on our obedience, we experience the completeness of love in our lives. Not only that, the Bible also says in the same book of 1 John that we can be confident before God in our prayers because we're obedient. 1 John 3 verse 21 says, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and we do what pleases him. And there's more. We can turn up the volume of obedience and experience a deeper relationship with God. 1 John 3 verse 24 says this, those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. Three things, completeness of God's love in us, confidence before God in prayer and a deeper relationship with him. Which believer doesn't want that? all received as we increase our volume on obedience to God's word, as we amplify being alive to God. And then in Galatians chapter 3 and in chapter 5, 
we read that our obedience to God's word brings us freedom in Christ. Now the world don't understand that logic. It doesn't understand the logic of be obedient to something and you will find freedom. It thinks that freedom is not having to be obedient to anything. That's not a heaven's logic. We find the fullness of our freedom in Christ as we are obedient to him. It was for freedom, it tells us, that Christ has set us free. You know, it is a ploy of the enemy to make us believe that obedience to God's word is oppressive, unpleasant, unreasonable and impossible because he does not want your life to be obedient to God because when we're obedient to God it expresses our love towards him and the enemy does not want people seeing your life expressing love towards God. Non-believers think that the Bible is a massive rule book. They think it's oppressive. They think it's burdensome. But John says it is not burdensome. We are, he says in 1 John 5 verse 3, this is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome. It's not burdensome. It's not too much for us. It's not too difficult for us. That's why it's good for us to go back and say, show me, not to be fearful of obedience, but how I can enjoy the freedom that comes in you as I am obedient to your word. Now, just because, you know, the yoke that Jesus puts on us is light, it doesn't always mean that it's particularly easy for us. And this is why we need the help of the Holy Spirit to go on this journey. You know, there's millions of Christians all around the world who are not moving fully in their purpose. Whatever your purpose in life is, I can absolutely guarantee you that the roots of your purpose are in God's salvation plan for this world. That's part of the Great Commission that we were given to go and make disciples of people, to baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them how to obey Jesus's command. Our destiny and our purpose is inextricably linked with that Great Commission. Everything we're asked to do can be traced back to that. That is what is at stake here, because salvation is the work of God, and when we are free to operate fully in the purposes of God. We are working with God on his salvation plan for this world. Turning up the volume on being alive to God means that we understand that our lives are for a bigger purpose than just living for ourselves. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, Jesus died for all and those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. I'm going to close in a moment with some closing thoughts but this is where we really show a maturity of turning up the volume on being alive to God. When we put behind us the, the childhood approach which is bringing our shopping list of wants and needs and demands before God. It is a grown-up thing to do to seek God's kingdom first and to trust that everything else that you would have asked for, God's going to take care of it. Now it doesn't mean that we're not to ask for what we, to take, what we want. The Bible encourages us to ask for everything that we want. But we seek his kingdom first. We seek through our lives to uh, be free in the freedom that we've got, to do everything that we are called to do that is about kingdom purpose, trusting that God has everything else in control. Not everybody will say, well, I know what my purpose is. Well, let's start with what you know God's will is. Turn up the volume on how much you love God. We show our love for God when we're obedient to his word, when we live in accordance with it, when we reckon ourselves dead to sin and alive to him. Lead a life that attracts others to Jesus. Deal with your habitual sins. Turn up the volume on how much you love people with the same love that you are loved by God. Let people hear your testimony. Come alongside somebody's ministry in prayer. Turn up the volume on unity. 
in your relationships, in your home, in your churches across the world. You know, the, the world is about to be flooded with man-made wisdom and advice from Harry and Meghan, Duke and Duchess of Sussex, via their new big contract with Netflix. You know, this is not what the world needs, right? The world needs a revelation of Jesus and they will see him in us as we live according to God's word, as we are obedient to his word, as we are mature in working out holiness. This is where our abundant life is. Not in a life that's dominated by sin, not in a life that's too proud to admit that our behaviour must change. We are to be holy as he is holy. We are to love as he has loved. We are to be in unity as Jesus and the Father are in unity. Sounds hard, it's not impossible. With God, all things are possible. Can I encourage you, I'm gonna pray in a moment, but can I encourage you just to meditate on the word, just ask the Holy Spirit to just reveal to you where have I got to turn down the volume on sin? Where have I got to reckon myself dead to it? Where am I going to turn up the volume on being alive to Christ? And see the difference that makes to your life. Let me pray and then we'll close. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity today to share in your word. Your word is powerful. You tell us your word is sharper than two, any two-edged sword and it's in these areas of our life that we need that sharpness we need that clarity and God we just join together as your people globally this morning and we confess we get things wrong we confess that there are unconfessed sins in our lives there are things that we allow ourselves to do we tolerate a level of sin but you're calling us to a new level and we don't want the enemy any longer to be able to exercise control that we've given him through our actions through our responses to being tempted we want to walk in your freedom we want to walk in your promises we want to know the completeness of your love in our lives. We want to know what it is to be so much more confident coming before you in prayer. We want to know the fullness of you in every way. We want to walk in our purpose, knowing that you will use our lives for a greater plan of salvation. But it starts with our repentance, Lord. And so I pray for everyone here who's committing again to return to your word, not to skip the verses that we're familiar with, but to go back and measure up our lives against you, measure up our lives against your word. Holy Spirit, you're awesome at this. You, you're going to help us hunt down our sin and you're going to help us hack it to pieces. Oh, we're going to enjoy some cake and pop. We're going to enjoy going on this journey with you because we know it's going to help us level up. We know it's going to help us amplify being alive in you. We know, Father God, that this is in accordance with your will. So I pray a blessing on everyone here who's listening, that you would protect them, God, that you would take them on this journey. And I pray, Father, for the speakers that are going to come after me today and tomorrow, that, Lord, you'll continue to build, Lord, on your word. Thank you, Father God, that we have hearts after you, that we would dedicate a weekend to you, Lord, and you will respond to that, Lord. There will be much fruit from this. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. That's all I've got for you today. Uh, four o'clock, I think that's right, Pastor, if not, you'll correct me later. Four o'clock is the later session today and look forward to sharing with you all again. So God bless everybody. Bye.